I'm Dr. James Thomas with VoiceDoctor.net. Welcome to Laryngology 101. This video is a continuation of a prior video on hemorrhagic vocal cord polyps. I'd like to add a few caveats to that video, and specifically I'd like to go over various types of surgical treatment and the outcomes afterwards. We saw Linda Smith who had these very large polyps. We listened to her voice. We found out that they're in the middle. They're often asymmetric. You get diplophonia from two vocal cords vibrating separate or two segments of the vocal cord and air leak and hoarseness. And we're going to see that in the patients today. Then we did a surgery where we went ahead and grasped her polyp, pulled it away and used a programmable laser to cut off the edge of the polyp, let it heal. And let's look at her outcome. Our goal is to have flexible vocal cords that come completely together. We're going to look at her at several pitches. Specifically, the higher we go in pitch, the tighter we pull the vocal cords. Any, if there's any stiffness from the surgery, we'll see it magnified at high pitch. She's very supple at low pitches and fairly supple as we get to the mid and higher pitches. Let's meet Richard. Richard has quite a few injuries to his vocal cords. We have a number of hemorrhagic polyps here. We'll take a listen to his voice. We'll see that he has air leak from in front and behind the polyps and that sometimes he has diplophonia. Now, we're gonna do a surgery on him and to do that, we're gonna take this instrument called a laryngoscope. This is a Zytel's laryngoscope. It has a hand piece for me to hold here and a piece that I can look through. And what I'm gonna do is put this in Richard's mouth lift the tongue up so that I have a straight shot down to see his vocal cords. And in fact, if you were looking down like this, you can see the end of the laryngoscope in the picture. So that's what's in the view. Then we're gonna use a set of instruments that are about a foot long and they have a little grasper on the end. These are called triangle forceps or scissors. And we're going to use those to work with the polyp. Now at this time, I had an older laser. It wasn't programmable, so it fires a single spot at a time and I use the laser to cut through the tissue. When it hits the blood, there might be a little more char or blackness there or a little bit more of a burn. And we wanna to try to avoid the burn because heat causes stiffness afterwards. I can use it to stop the bleeding also. The important thing is how does he do, how flexible are the vocal cords, do they come together afterwards? Have we gotten rid of the double pitch and the roughness? So here he is only two weeks later, he's rested his voice. We'll take a look at the vocal cords at low and then high pitches, and we'll see that he's still a little bit stiff, but he can clearly come together much better than he was before the surgery. So, successful outcome even though we used an older laser. Well, what if you don't have a laser? You can use the same type of instrument down the throat, a scissors that opens and closes at the end there, and we can cut off the hemorrhagic polyp. Let's take a look at Valerie's polyps. So, she has a rather small polyp. It's located in the middle on the right side. She's got the air leak and the diplophonia. During surgery, we put the laryngoscope in, we'll get a close-up view of that hemorrhagic polyp, and we're going to cut that off with a pair of scissors. There'll be a little bit bleeding there because the laser seals the tissue as you go. There'll be more bleeding with scissors than with the laser. Even so, this is a fairly minute polyp, perhaps only a sixteenth of an inch wide, so it's not even a lot of bleeding. It just looks like it under the microscope. The important thing is, a couple months later, how are the edges of the vocal cord and how flexible are they? We'll take a look at them vibrating and at two months they're really quite flexible both at low and high pitches. Jeffrey Chancellor, he's a businessman. He doesn't have time to stop and schedule a surgery. He said, what can you do for me? Can you get this out? I said, well, we can do it in the office. So it's not as precise as in the operating room when the patient's asleep and the vocal cords aren't moving, but it is possible to take out a hemorrhagic polyp in the office. And we're gonna use both scissors and a laser. And I have a pair of scissors that have been modified. They're operating room scissors that have a bend in them. And what I can do is take this, pass a camera through his nose, put this in his mouth, go around the corner, and then I can operate cutting down on the vocal cords. First, his polyp, he's got a fairly big one in the center of his vocal cords. It's giving him diplophonia and air leak in a very rough voice. And here we are in the office with a flexible camera looking down and cutting off the hemorrhagic polyp. Again, it bleeds because it has a blood supply. And at the end, he's got a little skin tag hanging off. And we're going to use a laser, which is a light beam, 
it's passed through a flexible fiber that goes through the endoscope, comes out the end, and will fire the light and ablate some of that excess tissue. Here he is a month later, and that area has healed that we've worked on, and we want to see how flexible it is. He's still got a little skin tag on the left side. It's a little stiff. This is only one month later. It should continue to soften with time. And when he continues to use his voice, that'll help with improving the flexibility. But he's already much better than when he had a large ball of blood hanging off the end. Randall Emmett, he's 87 years old. His general ENT found the polyp and said, I can't operate on you because you have a big spinal spur. I can't get uh, the endoscope down through your mouth. He's got a pretty big polyp, causes a lot of roughness in his voice, a lot of air leak. It flips in and out while he's talking. And again, we're going to operate on him in the office. And the reason for that is, here's his view of his vocal cords there in the distance. Here's his epiglottis. And here's the big spur. Ordinarily, we would see the whole larynx in the view here. But I can't get to that with a rigid endoscope. But in the office, I can snake my flexible endoscope around that, get a close-up view of his vocal cords, put this scissors through his mouth, and again, snip off the hemorrhagic polyp. One reason I wanted to show this is, at the end, there is this little bump of tissue left, so it's not as precise as in the operating room. But here he is a couple weeks later. Even with that bump, that is starting to smooth out. If we look at it six months later, you can't even tell there was a hemorrhagic polyp. It's now very flexible and supple and has a straight edge. Have a number of ways of taking out the polyp, but the most important thing is you have to find the polyp. And sometimes, finding the pathology is a little bit difficult especially if it's small. So let's take a look at Wilson, who's a singer. We'll look at Wilson's vocal cords. He says, as I sing, my voice gets worse and worse over the course of a show. When we look at him, he's got fairly flexible vocal cords. They're a bit red from the blood in them. And there is a red spot on the right vocal cord, but it's not impairing the vibration. How do we find it when there's no visible pathology? Well, went ahead and had him sing loudly for 10 minutes because that's what he tells me happens. He goes into a performance and his voice gets worse. Well, what does 10 minutes do? Vocal cords are vibrating 100, 200 times a second. He's singing loudly. The centrifugal force of the vibrations causes the blood to fill up the polyp and the polyp starts to stick out. So here he is. We'll look at this in slow motion. And now this red dot on the right side stands out even more. And if we Zoom in on it at a close-up, we'll actually see that it physically stands out from the vocal cord. So here's the damage, the capillaries leading to it, and here is that red spot which now stands proud of the margin. And when he sings at a high pitch and that touches, that causes him diplophonia, which is not useful for a singer. One other issue, muscle memory. I said that in general, there's no medication that'll make a hemorrhagic polyp go away. Speech therapy or voice therapy won't help, and surgery is the primary treatment. However, when I take off a polyp that's been on the vocal cords for a long time, a lot of times there is an issue called muscle memory. And Sarah has that. She's lived with this hemorrhagic polyp for a long time on one side, and she's become accustomed to that and keeps her vocal cords open at the back so that this bump doesn't touch the other side. She has the surgery. We cut this off in a traditional way use the scissors and a laser. And then when she comes back to see me a month later, she says, I'm still husky. Hee, my singing voice isn't good. And if we take a look at her vocal cords before and after, we'll notice that here she is holding them apart to keep this bump from touching. And after surgery a month later, she's still holding them apart as if there's a bump there. And that's from having used her vocal cords for a long period of time with the bump. So what a good voice teacher or voice therapist can do is teach her again how to close this gap now that the bump's not there and her voice will become clear. Let's take a look at one last case. We have a number of hemorrhagic polyps, a capillary lake, several dilated capillaries. There's been a number of vocal injuries here. So in summary, we can go through here with a laser, get rid of these various capillary lakes. When we work on the polyp, we pull it as far medially as we can and we cut it off with whatever technique we want. And we'll go from this type of voice, very rough, to a set of flexible vocal cords that are very supple. I'm Dr. James Thomas with VoiceDoctor.net. Thank you for listening.